pretty loud. <laughs> I know. They have to record it. <laughs> so I'll All right, not, here you can put this. This is not on. a Me Too moment, don't worry. <laughs> here, let me. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And then I. Yeah. Okay. This thing. Can I just throw it in my pocket? Or yeah, no? you can put it in your right. pocket. Remind me to give it back to you. Okay. All right. You want a clicker? Uh, a clicker is good, and. and uh, that's that's way too complicated. Okay. And to click, click is this. It, which one? It's the right button, or the right to forward. Okay. Um, Jonathan Rosenthal here from the Ecological Research Institute. Jonathan will be presenting partnering with land managers to guide the search for EAB resistance ash. And I do have these in a minute. Okay, great. And it's 15 plus questions, correct? Hopefully, my errant ways didn't cut into that. Okay. Um, so. Uh, as was mentioned, I, this is the title of my talk, and um, we'll be talking about the MAMA program overall, the Monitoring and Managing ASH. Uh, we came up with that name just to come up with a cool, catchy acronym, and so that our tagline is Come to MAMA. And, uh, and then we're uh, featuring also the Vermont Land Trust because they were one of our earliest and most enthousi enthusiastic partners, and we've really loved uh, working with them, and uh, so we'll feature them. Um, so Emerald Ash Borer, the, the um, important message that you need to get from this map is it's spreading rapidly, and about 99% mortality for the, uh, main nor uh, the main northeastern ash species. Those would be white, green, and black. And what this has led to is widespread hopelessness and resignation, which is probably being encountered in Vermont right at this very moment, right? We've gone uh, throughout the region and found places where uh, EAB has not arrived yet, and if it's far enough away, people are in denial and think there's nothing that has to be done about it because it's not a priority yet. And then you get to where the ash are dying off and people kind of freak out and say there's nothing that can be done about it. So um, our program was designed to uh, counter uh, these, uh, what I'd call non-productive or non-constructive emotional stages of EAB invasion. Um, so, however, resistant native ash um, provide great hope. I have to say that with the exclamation point. Um, so Dr. Kathleen Knight and uh, uh, Dr. Jennifer Cook of the uh, U.S. Forest Service use what are known as lingering ash to yield highly EAB resistant native ash. And lingering ash are rare individuals, typically, you know, at most 1%. Uh, um, there, there's some spatial variation in that, in that in some areas you'll have little clusters of them. For some species in some areas, it's probably, you know, one in a thousand um, trees. Uh, rare individuals that stay healthy years after almost all nearby ash are killed by EAB. So these are not just surviving, they're, they're thriving after other trees around them have died. And it's, uh, they've been found by um, Kathleen and Jennifer for, and their colleagues for all three widespread northeastern ash species. So all white, green, and black. Um, there's some information out there that they've never found this for black ash, and that's actually uh, not the case. Um, so I'll tell you about the uh, U.S. Forest Service EAB Resistance Breeding Program, which is being conducted at the U.S. Forest uh, Service Northern Research Station in Ohio. And so what they've done is collected scion from lingering ash in just a few Ohio and Michigan localities. That's just because it's where they're based and there's just a few people working on this. And for those of you who don't know what scion are, uh, scion are just twigs that you're cutting off the trees for use in vegetative propagation, for use in, um, 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 what's the word, grafting. And cloning these out. So they uh, uh, graft scion onto rootstock and that enables rapid clonal propagation. And as you see um, here, they're um, using actually susceptible rootstock so that all of the resistance that's occurring in the tree you know is attributable to that scion that's been grafted on, right? And resistance is actually assessed uh, by placing EAB eggs uh, on the clonal progeny and counting how many survive through each larval stage. So I just want to emphasize here that what they've done is, you know, scoured the landscape, found those few lingering ash trees, collected the scion, uh, grafted them onto rootstock, so they have multiple replicates, and then they're 
uh, ranching um, EAB on these, on these trees, right? So they're taking a pre-counted number of eggs, putting them on them, and the lingering ash clonal progeny, unlike those of susceptible trees, show resistance. So this isn't just tolerance, this is resistance because they're actually killing off or slowing the growth of um, eggs and or larvae. And there are various mechanisms. Here you have um, a larva that's been calloused over by the tree. Um, in some cases, the trees just seem to be uh, um, actually just repellent to the uh, adult EAB, which won't even lay eggs on them. And in that case, that's not even being captured here. So the levels of resistance that they're finding on these trees through the resistance assessment is actually being underestimated because they're actually making it easy for the EAB and putting the, the eggs right on there. Um, there are multiple mechanisms, um, but it, it almost doesn't matter because they work. Okay, what the particular mechanisms are. And so this project uses natural plus artificial selection. So it's taking advantage of the intense natural selection, which is, as we say, um, uh, typically 99%, if not more, in many cases, susceptibility, right? So natural selection is weeding out those susceptible trees and leaving us with just those few lingering ash. It, then they're crossing resistant lines. So they're doing that assessment, right? And the beauty of doing the clonal propagation is not just that you can have multiple replicates, but you can kind of leapfrog ahead a generation very quickly so that you're taking twigs from mature female and male trees, uh, grafting them onto the rootstock, and you know, within a year they're flowering and you're getting um, seed and so forth. So they're assessing these different lines, uh, taking the most resistant in terms of uh, um, killing or uh, the eggs or the larvae off, crossing them, and get, then getting really highly resistant within uh, uh, F1, within one sexual generation, really highly resistant trees. Um, they're now working you know, towards F2, and uh, that what they anticipate is once they uh, reach that point, they'll have uh, basically um, trees ready for what they call seed orchards for planting out um, and starting to um, uh, replenish our ash, not only in forests, but also in landscape situations. So um, their approach accelerates evolution. It enables mating between different resistant trees, which otherwise due to scarcity would be unlikely to exchange genes. If you think about it, say if you're one out of a thousand trees, you know, in a landscape that doesn't have a lot of ash trees, you're gonna be spread very far apart. These are wind pollinated um, and also, uh, there are still, you know, this bulk of the trees that are out there are non-resistant, so you're going to be exchanging genes with, um, with non-resistant trees. And, um, and it also, they're getting a lot of different combinations. So their goal isn't to have just one resistant line that's going to be planted out there. We want to preserve local genetic diversity. And uh, moving on to the next slide. So I just want to compare this approach uh, versus random seed saving. So one thing that's happened that a lot of people have done kind of across the range of ashes, they've gone out and they've done seed saving and seed banking. And the reason I'm bringing this up is one thing that we encounter a lot is we've done everything we can for ash already. We've saved them already, we've saved their seed. So I'm not trying to knock that effort. There are ways in which it can ultimately be helpful, but I'm going to compare this because it's, it's, we find a lot more promise in that. In that if you uh, say just plant the randomly collected saved seeds, what it would undo is undo all the natural selection for resistance that hap has happened out there in nature because 99 or 99.9% .9 of those seeds you're planting will give rise to susceptible trees, right? And then what you're just going to have is this um, huge growth in susceptible trees that will replicate exactly what happened when EAB first came over and encountered all these what we'd call naive trees, right? And the other thing uh, that happens is um, uh, we've also heard the notion that EAP, EAB disappears over time and uh, then once the EAB has disappeared from a site, you can plant all these susceptible seeds out there. And that's actually not the case. So our colleagues, again, Kathleen Knight out at USFS, have been tracking EAB mortality and, uh, excuse me, ash mortality EAB abundance since the onset of EAB infestation in uh, southeast Michigan and, and uh, Ohio, and every one of their plots, they still have EAB. So EAB can persist there in very small numbers on root sprouts and so forth. And uh, the other thing is if you're going out and planting a lot of uh, non-resistant ash, that's only ultimately going to dilute the resistance of the gene pool of the lingering ash. 
Um, so resistance is also likely needed even if biocontrol agents are established. Again, this isn't to knock biocontrol, but it's also seen as a panacea and it's seen as kind of very sexy, like, wow, you get these you know, natural enemies out there and it's an instant success and versus, ah, oh, breeding for resistance that's so slow and subtle and nuanced and do we really have faith in it? Um, so the resistance is likely needed even if biocontrol agents are successfully established um, as shown by first the EAB devastation of North American ash species planted in Asia despite EAB's natural enemies there. So before EAB even came here, we had sent thousands of green ash to China for reforestation projects and uh, it was their tree of choice around construction projects and so forth and these were just being absolutely ravaged by EAB uh, despite the presence of its natural enemies there and that was kind of a a death foretold that we should have kept in mind before it came here, but that's a whole other story. Uh, the second thing is that um, effective EAB biocontrol, you know, by itself to adequately control things is very unlikely where susceptible tree abundance supports large populations. And this is just due to the biology of EAB and the biology of um, uh, parasitoids and so forth being able to keep up with those populations. So there's a lot of literature that supports that. So the best approach is basically resistance plus biocontrol. If you think of it, that would be replicating the situation that EAB encounters with the native Asian ash in EAB's native range, that the primary, primary um, uh, impediment to EAB going crazy is the resistance, and then on top of that, you have the biocontrol as a top-down, so bottom-up and top-down. We need scion from locally adapted lingering ash th throughout ash's range because we want locally adapted, uh, diverse um, native ash. If you plant what's uh, uh, a resistant ash from Ohio in New York, it's likely, or in Vermont, sorry, I'm used to being in New York, or in Vermont, it's likely not to flourish because the soils are different, climate's different, so forth, and the food is different. The food's much better in Vermont than in Ohio. <laughs> Okay, so we need a major effort uh, given this huge area to be covered and the lingering ash rarity. And what we uh, have devised to uh, provide the solution is land managers and citizen scientists who can come to the rescue. So our overall program is called Monitoring and Managing Ash. As I mentioned, MAMA it launched uh, just in 2017 as an integrated framework for ash conservation and EAB mitigation. It includes four projects that are all on the anecdata.org uh, platform. I can't recommend uh, anecdata.org highly enough. It's an amazing newly designed citizen science platform. Those of you who are familiar with iNaturalist, this is a zillion times uh, better because this actually supports rigorous science. There are all sorts of features that Anecdata has that basically nothing else has and I'd be happy to talk with you um, in the hallway or wherever later about it. Um, so we have the four projects, MAMA Monitoring Plots Network, which I'll be focusing on, MAMA Ash EAB Surveys, uh, Potential uh, Lingering Ash Toolkit, and the Lingering Ash Search. So uh, why do we need a monitoring plot network? Uh, the monitoring plot network is needed because lingering ash are detectable only once the adult ash um, are showing EAB-induced mortality um, reaching at least 95% for at least two years, or uh, for at least 50% for, uh, for at least four years. So searching too early produces fal false positives. Waiting uh, too long means you miss out on trees that die either eventually from incomplete resistance or from other causes which are often people going out and cutting them. So you have to know exactly the right window of time to search for them. There are certain plot requirements. Um, I'm a little lagging here, so I'm going to zip through these. We'll just say that we, we took uh, uh, the USFS protocol and made it very flexible and um, accessible for everyone to use. So um, it, doesn't ha it, it doesn't have to be a particular um, shape. You just need at least 40 adult trees. And these obviously have to be not chemically treated. And, uh, I'll just leave it at that at this point. Data reporting, initial plot setup, and data recording should take less than two hours, and you just report information on tree location, canopy health, and EAB evidence. And we encourage use of printed data sheets for various reasons. It's like having an election. You want to have that paper trail. And uh, in high mortality areas, which you don't really have here yet, but we have a lot of in New York, plots can be one and done, no need to revisit. I'm making that point because this takes a minimal time commitment. Uh, it's a rapidly growing network. We're across much of New York, uh, Vermont, and New Jersey now. Uh, next year, we're going to be expanding throughout the Midwest and the Northeast.
And let me just go back for a second, because this is important. Vermont Land Trust has uh, played important roles, providing really crucial feedback. We're often, late, often going back and forth with Alaire and Peter and so forth who have great ideas and comments, and we're open to them. And it's three sites feature black ash, which is particularly important to us because it's overall scarcity in the Northeast and it's cultural and ecological importance. So here we have Vermont Land Trust uh, sites. Uh, we've been out to one of them, the rest, um, the Vermont Land Trust crew, uh, and it's, uh, it has done it on its own without our assistance. And uh, I think that's all I can say for it right now because I don't know my way around there. Uh, but you see that what's nice is some of them are on the edge of infestations and some have not reached them. Uh, the infestation has not reached there yet. Um, so it requires a training. We did a training at Vermont Land Trust. It was basically train the trainer and their whole staff got trained up. And we also um, open it up to uh, the general public and citizen scientists and other agency folks in the area and so forth. And we train everybody up in all four citizen science projects and our overall framework. Um, so here, um, one of the big takeaways is that we have tasks for each stage of EAB infestation. So lots of important stuff to do even before EAB has arrived. That covers a lot of Vermont. And lots of stuff to do uh, after, especially critically, is looking for those lingering ash um, after you reach really high uh, EAP infestation levels and mortality. Um, this is uh, a product that we produced for the Catskill, regions, Catskill region because they funded it for us, which is a Catskill Mama action map. And what we did is we took, we took uh, EAB invasion history with Jerry Carlson over here from New York DC provided us kindly and complemented it with data that citizen scientists are reporting to um, uh, develop this map and then highlight particular actions that are suitable for particular areas. Ultimately, we'd like to do this for everywhere, including Vermont and so forth. I will zip through. I know this is at the cost of questions, but sorry. Uh, um, Okay, sorry. Um, and then we have also overview of tools to help in decision making. This is our uh, uh, decision making chart. And, and I'll just say that we're handing these out and this actually has many of these items in it and our website is monitoringash.org. You can get a lot more information. And just a public service uh, announcement here, which is uh, there are lots of good reasons, as that chart stressed, to cut healthy ash in some cases, but don't do it with the idea that that's going to uh, stop uh, EAB from spreading, that it will slow the spread or stop it from spreading. In fact, it does the opposite. It accelerates the spread. So um, we uh, are urging people not to do that. And here you have real Vermonters out there setting up a plot. Um, if I can have like one half minute more. Yeah. So uh, what we've already gotten some really cool results, which is there's, uh, we're working with the Forest Service to potentially use FIA uh, data to also target areas that are uh, ready for lingering ash search. But it turns out there's a huge disparity between their data and what we're finding from our actual ash mortality plots. So we are now uh, working with them to try and calibrate their data and so forth. So here, for instance, you have what they're showing is 4% annual mortality for EA, uh, f from EAB on ash, and we already have 98% cumulative mortality. And we've already found some lingering ash, and what's that? I know, and I, I'm just going to thank everyone, and thank you for your patience, and sorry to get lost here. Thank you.